So the overview would, uh, would be in terms of uh, highlighting that volume overload is harmful. And we will touch upon the ROSE concept and what is de-resuscitation exactly? What are the terminologies associated with it? And when exactly do we need to think about de-resuscitation and how it is done? What are the different strategies that we have as of now? And when to stop de-resuscitation as well? So I think those are the things that we will dwell upon today. So we very much know that volume overload is definitely harmful and um, quite a few papers exist uh, for over the last uh, few years, uh, especially this one where there is a box graph showing you that any point of time within the critical care stay, be it 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours, uh, positive fluid balance will definitely uh, uh, have a high impact on survivability. So ICU survivability will uh, hamper uh, easily on the positivity of the fluid balance for that particular patient. So anybody who is uh, positively uh, balanced uh, will be uh, at, at risk of uh, mortality. So it, it's quite very well stated in many of the papers. Uh, so I think people have come up with uh, the stewardship. I think probably this might have been discussed in the previous talks in fluid management. Uh, the four Ds of uh, principles of uh, fluid administration. One of them that it needs to be treated as a drug. Uh, any fluid should be treated as any other drug and the dose of the fluid that needs to be administered should be prescribed. The duration of administration should also be uh, noted and uh, uh, last D would be based on de-resuscitation. Like uh, akin to the uh, uh, antibiotic stewardship, uh, fluid stewardship is very highly recommended uh, by Malbrain et al. way back in 2018. So how do we commonly administer fluids? Normally we either give it as a bolus during the resuscitation phase and uh, quite a significant work done by Rhodes et al. from uh, UK uh, typically recommends four ml per kilo to be given over 10 to 15 minutes to correct hypovolemia or hypotensive shock apart from using inotropic uh, supports. And a fluid challenge uh, typically uh, uses a 10 to, uh, sorry, 100 to 200 ml of fluid over five to 10 minutes. And this is typically followed by uh, an assessment of hemodynamic status. And this can typically be a passive leg raising test as recommended by the surviving sepsis campaign uh, to see if, there are, uh, if the response is adequate for that particular challenge. So these are typical ways of administering the fluid. So what exactly do we mean by volume overload? So this is very well uh, appreciated in terms of uh, numerical value, which can be obtained by a cumulative fluid balance in liters divided by the patient's baseline body weight. And if this fraction is multiplied by 100, that would give a percentage. And if this percentage uh, is more than 10%, then the patient is uh, having uh, fluid overload or volume overload. So that would define uh, if the patient is in volume overload. So having defined what is volume overload uh, and what exactly uh, makes volume overload harmful is the effect on uh, impaired oxygenation, the metabolic diffusion is uh, at stake because of the tissue edema. The tissues are distorted in architecture and the capillary blood flow can be easily compromised. And the lymphatic drainage, which plays a vital role, uh, is also compromised. And all the cell-to-cell -cell interactions is at stake. So this is pretty much uh, the uh, scenario in encapsulated organs like liver and kidneys, uh, which bears the uh, attack at a higher level. And then we have got this uh, increased intra-abdominal uh, pressure, uh, which can go on to uh, become a compartmental syndrome. And uh, uh, that can get uh, generated into a, a polycompartmental syndrome as well. And multi-organ dysfunction uh, can be an issue. And fluid overload by 24 hours easily happens in at least 67% of early goal-directed therapy patients. And nearly 40% is in the hospital for the 
six to show There's some problem with the audio. Can you just check that? Now, sir. Is that is that audible? Yeah, now fine, sir. Can you just repeat the last part, sir? It was not all previous slide, last part. Oh, okay. So I think Kel Metal uh, did have a paper uh, suggesting that early goal-directed therapy for patients uh, easily results in nearly 70% of the patients having volume overload by 24 hours, and at least more than 50% of the patients who are hospitalized uh, having undergone resuscitation uh, will be in a volume overload status. So it's, it's a significant uh, effect that tends to happen following resuscitation. So what is the evidence for uh, volume overload being harmful? Quite a significant way it has been illustrated in many uh, trials. Uh, for instance, uh, Malbrain et al's systematic review in 2014 shows a overall mortality of uh, having volume overloaded in critically ill patients. SOAP study increased mortality shown in patients with acute kidney injury being volume overloaded. And patients with acute lung injury and ARDS, again, uh, fact trial did show a prolonged uh, recovery that they take while being on mechanically ventilation, ventilated. And VAS trial did show uh, worse mortality in septic shock patients who are volume overloaded. And same thing tends to happen in colorectal surgery patients. <clears throat> so it is beyond doubt that uh, people who are uh, having volume overload, metabolic state, uh, that, that has to be borne in mind that there is the increased oxygen demand and the patient needs multiple uh, parameters that needs to be normalized to make uh, the organ perfusion and the organs which are at stake of uh, being coming to harm needs to be prevented. So if you look at the slide in terms of the early flow phase going on to become the late flow phase, it is typically the third day as the arrow points that usually people tend to change from the early flow to late flow, whereby the uh, catabolic state tends to change and the amount of oxygen requirement or the catabolism tends to reduce. And this is a normal response. And this has been illustrated by Burima et al, where they uh, looked at rats who were inflicted with abdominal uh, sepsis. They tend to uh, change from the state of early catabolism to slowed down catabolic state by day three. So this is what we tend to expect by the change of day three to day four. Unfortunately, if it is going to uh, progress and still they seem to be highly catabolic, then probably it is just a pathognomonic of uh, uh, severe disease. So if you look at the flow phase, the characteristics that we uh, highlighted here is the increased oxygen consumption. So the organ perfusion, the uh, tissue uh, supply of oxygen is the key thing that one needs to target in terms of delivering these to prevent any further organ damage. So there is increased carbon dioxide production and there is fluid retention and there is a systemic inflammatory response as well, all of them culminating in multi-organ failure. So what exactly happens uh, in terms of any kind of injury that the host uh, uh, is, is faced with? So the three hit model tends to illustrate it a little bit clear. So the initial insult is uh, by the inflammatory insult and that is when the F phase happens and that is when the resistative phase happens. The fluid is life-saving in that case and the parameters to monitor there are the dynamic uh, parameters of uh, hemodynamics, uh, where you look at uh, stroke volume variance, pulse pressure variance, and the key there is to have a early adequate goal-directed fluid management, and the patient is likely to go in for a positive fluid balance, for sure. 
Subsequently, they go in for a second hit, and the second hit is because of a good resuscitation and the ischemia reperfusion injury happens. And that is when the flow phase sets in. And the flow phase, if it were to continue without any resolution, that is a key biomarker of a severe critical illness rather than the host taking over that kind of an insult. So here, probably we are looking at the organ function Say, for example, in case of a lung, uh, extravascular lung volume index, or in case of the abdomen, intra-abdominal pressure, these are some of the things that can be monitored to look at uh, specifically at the organ functions. And the key to here, in case of uh, second hit, would be to have a late conservative fluid management, which we will touch upon later, uh, that uh, focuses on having a negative fluid balance of at least two consecutive days within the first week of management. So ideally, we are trying to uh, have a neutral balance over there. And the subsequent uh, phase of third hit is what exactly uh, where the uh, whole talk impinges upon in terms of how this third hit is happening and what we can do about it. That is when the global increased uh, um, permeability syndrome happens, which is the GAPS and GAPS uh, GIP syndrome. So there, the flow phase regresses the fluid, anything that is being given will be toxic. And we are looking for organ perfusions as a goal. And this is when we want to have a late goal-directed fluid management, and we want to achieve a negative balance. So we understand what is the first hit, second hit, and the third hit. And what happens during the first hit, there is a shock and there is a ischemia. And the second hit, there is a resuscitation followed by reperfusion injury. And the third hit is characterized by a global increased permeability syndrome. So what does it uh, do? So there is quite a significant uh, insult to uh, majority of the uh, organs within the body causing peripheral edema, which we all see. Uh, and that can catapult into rhabdomyolysis if there is going to be an extremity compartment syndrome. So also there can be cerebral edema uh, due to intracranial hypertension, and that can be associated lung edema, acute lung injury, ARDS, and uh, compartmental syndrome in the abdomen, and acute kidney injury resulting from acute tubular necrosis as well. So you can easily see that the global increased permeability syndrome uh, catapulting into uh, polycompartmental syndrome resulting in multi-organ dysfunction. So what exactly uh, uh, identifies this? So what exactly is the uh, capillary leak index? It is nothing but uh, C-reactive protein uh, over albumin ratio. So CRP divided by albumin in milligrams per liter uh, is the capillary leak index. So how much do you need to have to qualify for GIPS? Uh, so I think uh, probably we dwelled on how the volume overload is going to be a, a harmful feature. And uh, we went on to Rose concept. Uh, sorry about that uh, glitch. So we were on uh, the ebb and the flow phase and talking about that uh, third day when uh, the transition tends to happen normally and the flow phase where the oxygen consumption is at its peak and there is fluid retention and systemic inflammatory response tends to happen, causing a multi-organ failure as well. So we did look at the uh, three heat model and the third heat model is what we were going to focus upon with um, global increased uh, permeability syndrome, which was in place. And the first hit caused by ischemia, second hit caused by reperfusion, and the global increased permeability syndrome causing uh, polycompartmental syndrome having an uh, impact on almost all the organ systems. So the leak index and um, the high capillary leak index uh, is quantifiable by C-reactive protein by albumin ratio. And uh, if it were to be more than 60, and that tends to qualify for GIFs. And there are a few papers to suggest if the normalization of the microcirculatory blood flow does not happen by day three, then the, probably the severity of the disease itself is so severe that it will 
uh, cause multi organ Research is the extravascular lung water index and the pulmonary vascular permeability index. And these two parameters, if they are on the lower side, then the chances of survival is better. Or if they are on the higher side, then you are probably going to diagnose that there is presence of a global increased permeability syndrome. So, what are the phases of associated organ failures? So that is typically the resuscitation phase, optimization phase, and the stabilization phase, and the uh, uh, evacuation phase. So initially, if you are going for some balance, yes, during the resuscitation phase, there's going to be a positive balance that invariably tends to happen uh, within minutes. And subsequently, during the second hit, which tends to happen over a uh, few hours uh, going on to days, the, during the hip phase, during the optimization phase, the patient is still going to be unstable, moving on to the stable phase of the stabilization phase over next couple of days. And during the third day on to the fourth day, the uh, uh, evacuation phase will come in. That is when the hit three happens to happen. And uh, hit four is something new uh, that we didn't touch upon in the previous slides where there is deresuscitation tends to happen on its own and the hypovolemia sets in and this hypovolemia can again cause uh, similar damage like the resuscitative phase. So uh, that, that, that tends to happen after a long period of time, maybe a week later. Looking at the organ failure that tends to happen during these different phases of uh, fluid balance. During the resuscitation phase, yes, uh, the organ failure, which was uh, nearly at stake, uh, multi-organ failure could have easily happened, but for the resuscitation that we have uh, done to the patient, the organ failure incident tends to climb down with the deresuscitation, and the organ failure again can creep up during the hate 4 when there is a hypovolemia. So ho hope this concept of... Uh, different phases of fluid balance is well appreciated with regard to the fluid balance and the organ failure that can happen. So have a look at the individual aspects of uh, the resuscitation phase. Focusing on the oxygen deficit at this stage can be because of convective problems and the fluid need will need to be somewhere around 4 ml per kilo being given as a bolus. And there is a mandatory need at this resuscitative stage. And people tend to go for a positive balance, which is inevitable. And the tools to monitor and the targets are uh, well explained in these multiple parameters uh, as MAP more than 65, cardiac index more than 2.5, uh, pulse pressure variation to be kept less than 12%. Uh, and uh, left ventricular diastolic area index of uh, more than eight. So here the goal will be for an early adequate uh, fluid management. And to uh, sum summarize, it will be a life-saving rescue uh, that tends to happen to salvage the organs during the resuscitation phase. Then the subsequent optimization phase, this phase is classically unstable stage and it is the second hit that tends to happen because of reperfusion. And the oxygen deficit is not a major problem here, having resuscitated well. But if there is not much of conservation on, in terms of fluid boluses that is being given, or if the titration of maintenance fluid is not done, then uh, the further damage can also happen here. So the positive fluid balance, if it were to happen here, then it is a classical biomarker of severity of the disease. So what are the tools that we tend to monitor? Uh, it can be hemodynamic monitors, and we try to achieve uh, a target of MAP of 65 again, cardiac index and left ventricular end diastolic area index, and uh, the abdominal parameters in terms of uh, abdominal perfusion pressure. Uh, so pretty much the similar parameters that was uh, monitored in the previous phase as well. So here the goal will be to maintain tissue perfusion and rescuing the organs from further damage. So what happens in the third stabilization phase? So it is the third hit and the flow phase is still there 
and the patient is much more stable. So hence the stabilization phase happens. Here, there can be, uh, uh, again, the reperfusion that was suggested in the optimization phase can cause organ damage. Oxygen deficit can happen because of diffusion problems, because of the edema. And classically, there can be a, a neutral or negative balance if the deresuscitation happens on its own or the disease progresses very well with the host immunity. Here, the parameters to monitor and the tools are in terms of uh, extravascular lung water index coming into play, pulmonary vascular uh, permeability index coming into play, intraatic uh, uh, pressure that can be monitored as well. So you can see the parameters are more focused in terms of uh, organ perfusion. So here the goal will be for a late conservative fluid management, which typically is a two consecutive days of negative fluid balance. So that would be the aim here. So we are trying to support the organs at that particular stage. So coming to the fourth phase of evacuation phase, here there is no flow and the patient is recovering and this typically happens over days to week. And this is where the global increased permeability syndrome could cause a damage. And here fluids will be detrimental and we don't want to give any IV fluids. Oral intake, if it is adequate, that should be more than adequate. And we really want to see a negative balance. And the parameters to look here have been suggested uh, bioimpedance assay, uh, but these are not classically used by the bedside by many. So the goal here will be uh, to have a late goal-directed fluid removal, which typically is the deresuscitation. So in other words, late goal-directed fluid removal is exactly what is meant as deresuscitation. So this was well illustrated uh, by uh, Malbray et al. in 2014 uh, position statement paper. So let us look at what is deresuscitation in detail. So what the water or the fluids, which was the solution, can be a problem itself. So the terminology that we quoted was late goal-directed fluid removal, and there should be aggressive step taken, and there is active fluid removal, uh, which can be done using diuretics or using a RRT, renal replacement therapy, with net ultrafiltration to achieve this deresuscitation. So what are the benefits of deresuscitation? Well, it can be in terms of uh, well-illustrated paper showing uh, that there extravascular lung water index, the bold line that you see there shows the drop in the extravascular lung water index. So over day five, six, there is a significant drop in extravascular lung water index with deresuscitation. And if you look at the fluid balance, the bold lines suggesting that the fluid accumulated balance is also on the lower side by day four, day five. And the uh, proportional patients who are alive, the darker line on the top shows that the mortality benefit is there with deresuscitation. And the PO to FAO to ratio improves with deresuscitation by day four and five. So there is a clear benefit shown uh, from this paper. So what are the recommendations for clinical practice? Are there any recommendations at all? So from Malbray et al's paper in anesthesiology and intensive uh, therapy, there are few recommendations in place. So there are only three recommendations as of now that we have in place. And these are with regard to when to deresuscitate. So after acute resuscitation has been completed, when the inciting tissue or the source control is addressed, it is suggested that we can use a protocol to avoid positive cumulative fluid balance in critically ill patients. And this has a grade C recommendation. So it has been suggested that we could have a protocol in place to achieve a negative balance after the initial resuscitation and after the inciting tissue and source control is addressed. So when exactly should we deresuscitate? So whenever there is a fluid overload and this fluid overload is causing a new end organ dysfunction. So this is the time that we need to identify and subsequently de-resuscitate. 
So what are the parameters are we looking at? So one patient has got a positive cumulative fluid balance and there is a new organ dysfunction. And these can be quantifiable in terms of poor oxygenation, which is perfusion uh, PF ratio less than 200, increased capillary leak as suggested by a high um, pulmonary vascular permeability index of more than 2.5, extravascular lung water index of more than 12, in case of abdominal parameters, increased intra-abdominal pressure, abdominal perfusion pressure, if it were to be lower than 50, and if it is uh, uh, more than 60, a value of capillary leak index. These are uh, specific parameters which have been suggested that we can come to a conclusion that these organs are at stake, which is have happened due to a positive cumulative fluid balance along with that in place. So these are the specific parameters when you should think about de-resuscitating. So another recommendation that they've come up with is a goal of zero to negative fluid balance by day three, and to keep the cumulative fluid balance on day seven as low as possible. This takes a grade 2B recommendation. So how to de-resuscitate? This is the third recommendation, and it has got a weak suggestion. And the suggestions were two of them. One, to use a diuretic. The other one is to uh, do a RRT. So RRT could be done in combination with albumin. And after acute resuscitation is completed and the source control is addressed. So pretty much in line with when to de-resuscitate and how to de-resuscitate is by two means with a weak suggestion is all we have till date. So let's look at uh, de-resuscitation strategies. Do we actually have an excellent strategy? Probably not. Let us look at some of the literatures available. One is uh, by Codman et al. They looked at patients who have got ARDS and they came up with this PAL approach. P for PEEP, A for albumin, and L for Lasix, which is fruzamide. And what they did was they gave a higher PEEP of uh, which equals to at least intra-abdominal pressure for that particular patient. And this high PEEP is kept for 30 minutes. And simultaneously, there is administration of albumin up to 200 ml over 30 minutes on day one. And they titrated it to uh, albumin level of more than 30 grams per deciliter. And they also administered fruzamide. And this infusion was kept at 60 milligrams per hour for four hours and then it was titrated to achieve a urine output of more than 100 ml. And this approach was used to achieve a negative fluid balance. And this showed a reduction in extravascular lung water index, intra-abdominal pressure, and also they showed a reduced duration of ventilation without compromising any further organs. So this is the only uh, resistative, de-resistative approach that we've got to date uh, in terms of strategy, what can be followed. And this is pertaining to an ARDS patient. So let us have a look at uh, what are the optimal fluid strategies while we are talking about de-resistation. And the strategies can be of these four types. One is this early adequate fluid management, which is defined by more than 50 ml per kilo of fluid within the first 12 to 24 hours of ICU stay. And if you're looking at early conservative fluid management that is qualified by less than 25 ml per kilo during the first 24 hours of ICU stay. And the later managements in terms of late conservative fluid management is defined by two consecutive days of neutral or negative balance within the first week of ICU stay. And the late liberal fluid management where there is an absence of two consecutive days of negative Fluid, ba fluid balance. So these are different defined fluid strategies that one could use while thinking about de-resuscitation. So what evidence have we got about these different strategies? Murphy et al., Cordman et al., and Hartrup, they have done some studies on this. And if you look at the amount of mortality with these different fluid strategies, the early adequate along with late conservative has got a lowest mortality rate with Murphy et al. Whereas if you take into account the 
late liberal, late liberal, liberal by any of the wor working groups in terms of Murphy or Codman, both of them have got a higher mortality rate. So that is clearly visible here in terms of higher mortality with late liberal therapy. And the early therapy can be adequate or conservative, it doesn't matter. So with both those two early different strategies, you are still going to have a higher mortality in both these two groups. So we have to judicially give fluids and remove fluids. So it is a fine fluid balance that one has to strike. So with, with regard to uh, the opinions that what, what um, ICU people have been do, doing in terms of uh, de-resuscitation, I think the opinions are quite divided. And this is evident from at least two or three papers where the uh, intensivist survey have been done in three of these papers. And the results are uh, quite alarming that we don't have a definitive de-resistative measures in place and people tend to uh, follow different strategies. So in having a decision made as to when to de patients is lacking and there is a wide variation. And this very well highlights that the decision making is quite complex in these uh, terms. And what exactly do they do to de resuscitate? And what are the appropriate indications, timings, and techniques? The opinions that has been obtained uh, from this uh, uh, intensive care physicians across two continents uh, from Europe and also Canada uh, did highlight the fact what are the factors that they took into consideration? So if you look at this slide in terms of the individual parameters, the black ones were of least importance. And if you look at the hashed areas, striped areas, they were given more importance. So the parameter of CVP, bicarbonate levels, these did not have a high value when they considered about de-resuscitation. And the amount of time spent and the edema, presence of edema, presence of fluid overload, all these things were given much more importance. And the most importance was given to high inspired oxygen concentration if there was a lung failure. So pulmonary congestion on chest imaging. So these two factors were given much more importance. So the reason I am stating these few slides in the next few uh, slides as well is to highlight what our intensive care uh, peer group thinks from these three uh, papers that has been highlighted. In terms of paucity of the evidence that is available, I think this has much more value added to what peers think across the continent. So it is the presence of pulmonary congestion on chest x-ray, high FAO2 requirement, cumulative positive balance, and elevation in the urea creatinine. These have been given much more weightage to think about this. So So they use certain so like heavily on clinical findings by themselves. If there is a positive fluid balance, the fluid is oxygen recovery and these are the most relied parameters by any uh what is relying less on? These are the parameters that lung ultrasound, static output devices, transparent. So maybe these three parameters are less used by the other devices. So probably uh, it cannot be less significant from the conclusion from these uh, parameters. So what is the modality that they are used? So what they used? Majority of them on RRT. So RRT was most likely to be used as a higher therapy. And the only patients had oliguria and urea, then nearly 80% of the patients uh, did sort to RRT. And they also had a, a trial of diuretic therapy in 60% of them. And if there was a significant acute kidney injury, and there is no traditional indication for RRT, even then they would resort to diuretics and nearly half of them resorted to it. And nearly 50% of them would 
think about deregistration if there is a significant fluid overload then they would go for cardiac so majority of them, the nearly 88% resorted to anti as a popular alternative of deregistration So looking at indications as per fluid status, a significant increase in body weight above baseline, 50% of them, and significantly positive fluid balance, nearly for 60% of them, and a radiological future suggesting fluid overload in 80% of them were indications to, to remove fluid. And a highlighted point here is 86% of them agreed that they will not rely on CVP as a parameter to suggest deregistration. So what are the fluid removal targets? So usually, as long as you think about some of the respondents from UK as such, they had a preset, a clinician preset parameter as a fluid removal strategy. So they would say one liter off, two liters off, whatever the clinician sets as a parameter to remove fluid. And fluid removal, targeted to clinical examination findings was by 60% of them. And the fluid removal titrated to physiological parameters like uh, monitoring cardiac output measurements, blood pressure and gas exchange was opted by nearly 50% of them. So in essence, you can see uh, that generally people had a preset mind, this is what I'm going to remove and probably lesser percentage chose to re-examine the patient go for certain tools like cardiac measurement, blood pressure, gas exchange, individualize the organ parameters, and then take a call. So the variation was not too much. So coming to a important uh, evidence that we have got till date, although this RADAR2 trial, which is undergoing since 2018, we don't have the results yet, but I think it will be very useful to look at uh, what are the criteria that they've included? And this is by the um, Irish and the Canadian group, which has been started since 2018. And they are hoping to uh, publish the results in June 2020. And if you look at what are the criteria that they would uh, uh, think in terms of deregistrating, if there is a presence of edema in more than one site, uh, be it arms, legs, flanks, abdominal wall, or in lungs, as suggested by uh, PO to FA to ratio uh, less than 300, chest x ray is consistent with pulmonary edema, or if there is a cumulative fluid balance in ICU of more than two liters. So that would have the inclusion criteria for B resuscitation. And these patients had spent at least 48 hours in ICU. And what are the contraindications they had to deresuscitate? So if there is a significant inotropic support, say for example, norepinephrine of more than 0.2 mics per kilo per minute. And if there is more than one vasopressor that has been used, and there is a significant uncorrected electrolytes, be it hypokalemia, hyponatremia, or hypernatremia. These were parameters they thought should be a contraindication to deresuscitation. And what was the uh, proposal that they had? So the strategy to use this was the initial prescription of diuretics. I know it may not be very obvious from the screen, but I'll read that out for you. Initially, they would give five milligrams of indapamate as a single dose. That is via enteral route. And then 100 milligram of spironolactone orally once daily, and they would go for 0.5 milligram per kilo, maximum of 40 milligrams of rosemide as a single intravenous bolus on the day. So initial and recruited, and subsequently they would see the patients over day three, day four, and the closure of the study happens on day five. And they would commence a frosamide infusion, which is part of the protocol and the starting rate would be five milligram per hour. And the review will happen at every class they will be reviewing the patient. And what was the output, the fluid balance in terms of whether it is less than 250 or is it more than 750 So if it is less than 
250 and they would increase the furosemide infusion rate and if it is more than 750 ml negative then they would reduce the furosemide infusion rate by half and if the fluid balance that you achieve is more than 750 on the maximal rate then they would stop the infusion rate but if you are going to lie in between if you are going to be in between 250 ml and 750 ml negative then you can continue with the current regimen so this is with regard to the diuretic regimen so if diuretic were not be administered and if they resorted to uh, uh, rrt then they would try and achieve uh, 83 ml per hour negative fluid balance so this was the protocol they resorted to uh, and it is useful to know what was done in this particular study and to watch for the results of this study and this would form a strategy in terms of deresuscitation as well so from this particular parameters what we have looked at in terms of the conceptual idea of how the uh, fluid flows in terms of different stages of uh, insult to the body and also uh, when one should deresuscitate there are few suggestions for practice so one can be roads at all who have done quite a bit of extensive study that the initial resuscitation where you are going to give fluid boluses can be to the tune of 4 ml per kilo maintenance fluids i think we need to resort to only 1 ml per kilo and that has to be only if it were to be given we need to ascertain the reason for giving any maintenance fluids and then we need to clinically monitor and also have certain lab parameters to assess the fluid status so this can be in terms of clinical parameters like fluid status and we very well know what is volume overload which is the 10% of the uh, fluid overload uh, status when compared to the body weight so that will define the volume overload status so clinically we can take that parameter into account then the hemodynamic parameters pertaining to certain organs like the lungs or be it abdomen we can clearly trans translate those individual parameters to assess if there is a organ damage or ensuing organ damage so you can look at those lab parameters to give a clue then look for diagnosing the fluid overload status and the emerging organ dysfunction so that is exactly uh, what will emerge out of gibbs syndrome so if there is a gibbs syndrome it will be qualified by a fluid overload status along with a new organ dysfunction so we need to have a suspicion to look for such a state by day 3 or day 4 so there is a clear cut recommendation although the uh, evidence is lacking to a higher level we that we need to have a protocol to drive deresuscitation so there are two modalities one is to consider diuresis and the next one is to consider rrp so these are two modes that have been suggested and the uh, work as such is brit brit uh, preliminary at this stage and codman et al is one work that has been done in ards patients and now uh, the new trial rada 2 trial will shed some more light to the, to us and albumin usage has also been suggested in the 2014 paper by uh, manu balbrain et al so these are some of the suggestions we have to date in terms of deras state to practice so in a nutshell uh, what deras station means is uh, it is a late goal directed fluid removal strategy so what exactly deresuscitation is it's a late goal directed fluid removal active fluid removal strategy why should we do it yes fluid overload is a independent predictor of mortality and morbidity which we very well appreciate and know when should it be done when the stabilization phase has been achieved probably you are looking at day 4 and the fluid overload is impacting on the organ function and there is a new organ dysfunction so how can we do it to date probably you are relying on diuretics usage or net ultrafiltration can be done on rrt so how much should we do it so actually exactly the parameters that will spell out the indication for deresuscitation if it is achieved to a greater level then we should stop deresuscitating 
So if we over de-resistate, then again, we are looking at going back to hit one where you've got hypovolemia, going in for a shock again, and you're resulting in a organ damage again. So we don't want to cause uh, overt de-resistative de measures as well. And that again will cause uh, hyperfusion of the organs. So that is pretty much in nutshell about uh, de-resistation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful talk. I think uh, most of the new ICUs we are having this rose diagram put up in the notice board because we'll be having patient on day one, day six, day four in the same place. So our team will be oriented regarding what actually will be our strategy. Okay, so look for this day uh, resuscitation and uh, we'll try to discuss during our round how to start uh, the resuscitation. Okay. So we'll uh, quickly go to the audience if anybody wants to clarify something. I think it's, it's much more of a concept and that has to be introduced yeah. into practice. And uh, quite I a few strategies. There, 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 are some, sorry, uh, there, there are some queries in the chat box. Uh, so, uh, Sharda wants, uh, and what is CLI normal value? Um, CLA has to be capillary leak index uh, less than 60 uh, is what is suggested in some of the papers and uh, CLA of more than 60 uh, is suggestive of uh, Gibbs syndrome. So probably that can be one of the parameters uh, that will identify Gibbs syndrome. So more than 60. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, there was a query like uh, if patient develops an acute kidney injury, shall we continue with the resuscitation? I think I've mentioned in your talk also. Uh, yes, I think um, it, it's, it all the more suggests whether uh, this initial insult happened during the early stages or later on, be it. But if there is an AKA, then the risk of having a fluid overload on top of AKA is going to be a higher mortality case. So in which case, all the more that you've got evidence that we need to go for a deresuscitation. Probably here, majority of them might choose RRT. So there is no harm in going for a, a initial diuretic usage and see what, what the response is. And majority of them, as per the surveys show, probably uh, people would choose a RRT. So yes, deresuscitation can very much be an option in this particular patient who has got a AKA with fluid overload. Uh, there were some doubts regarding how to use albumin infusion. Yes. During a the resuscitation. Okay. And we don't have a clear cut strategy yet, but um, what Codman et al. did was uh, they gave around to the tune of 200 ml uh, of albumin, 20% uh, that was infused. And um, that was pertaining to ERDS particular patients. Uh, but whereas the albumin is suggested to be used uh, in case of uh, destabilization if it were to happen during the de-resuscitation phase. Say for example, you're going to give diuretics and the patient is on a very minimal inotropic support. So in which case, I think the albumin would be a good choice along with the diuretic use. So these are some of the practices. These are anecdotal, truly anecdotal. So these can be practiced. So along with albumin using a diuretic, along with albumin RRT being used so these are anecdotal and can very well be used. Okay, I think we should wait some more time for uh, robust evidence to come up because this practice is starting recently. Right? I agree. Yeah. Okay, and there were some queries I think you have addressed during your lecture also, like how to identify uh, when to start uh, de resuscitation and all, which is covered during your lecture. So any more uh, queries you can put in, uh, in the chat box, we'll address that. So Nishan is asking, can we do isolated ultrafiltration for uh, fluid removal? Isolated ultrafiltration for fluid removal. Yes, yes, pretty much possible. Um, so the parameter to look at is that the patient is in a volume overload status. And if you have looked at the parameters, and if the patient is having more than 10% uh, volume overload, uh, which is calculated based on the uh, cumulative fluid balance, and 
uh, if that is the case, and even without any presence of other organ damage, and here the case will be towards preventing further organ damage, you can very well resort to net ultrafiltration. Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned regarding the radar to study. Is yep. the protocol we are following to start on diuretic initially enteral dose and then continuous intravenous infusion? Yes. Um, they had the protocol where they would go for a single dose of indapamide, spironolactone, followed by the prosumate infusion. And uh, subsequently, if there is uh, no effect to that, then RRT was in place. So there is no harm in using the diuretic. Uh, but there seems to be a uh, higher percentage of respondents, at least from uh, European countries and uh, Canada, that they resort to RRT straight away. So th that is a difference of practice. And I think you uh, mentioned the uh, concerns regarding this electrolyte in here. Correct. There was one query, how often we check electrolytes during this uh, fluid removal? So. Um, I think if you had to look at the diselectrolytemia per se, the uh, fluid compartmental shifts that were to happen along with this act to uh, deresuscitation, then there is a higher uh, diselectrolytemia at stake. So one has to be cognizant of that, uh, that um, if already there is an existing electrolyte imbalance, then you need to factor that in, in especially when you're going to remove further volume so a huge volume removal at that particular state can have volume shifts and diselectrolemia and that can worsen the picture. So the initial picture before attempting uh, fluid removal, active fluid removal, uh, if there is already diselectrolemia, better to correct it at least to a reasonable level uh, before uh, attempting deresuscitation. I think the uh, RADA2 trial highlights that. So they have clear cut, uh, have got that uh, contraindication before attempting deresuscitation. Is there any advantage of using torsamide over prosamide, at least uh, in some cases? And I haven't, I haven't got personal uh, opinion, but if you had to factor in uh, other parameters for that particular patient uh, about, about the renal status, cardiac status, then I'm, I'm sure every one of us have got uh, a choice of diuretic to be used in those circumstances, factoring, factoring in the potassium levels as well and electrolyte levels. If you take into electrolyte levels based on the mode of action of the diuretics, I think you can choose the uh, uh, appropriate diuretic based on that. Anyway, I think we also have to take decision whether the patient was already on diuretic for some other indication. Even before their first hit, we have to consider those factors before uh, applying this. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. Fine. Um, actually, uh, when I was discussing with Anu, we were telling like uh, most of the emergency laparotomy is inside the OT when the patient gets shifted to um, a critical care unit or ICU. There will yes. be a huge positive balance most of the time because uh, during anesthesia, I think uh, nowadays when it's changing, uh, they used to manage all the hypotension with fluid bolus. So in a laparotomy lasting for two, two and a half or three hours, they would have given many fluid boluses and less of pinotrope vasopressor use, which actually contradicts our practice towards uh, bowel surgeries when there is bowel anastomosis, it has protocol when it is applicable and not. So basically our idea was to put this concept across to all the anesthesiologists when they are managing, like it's not the fluid that's always going to help So there, you have to consider the post of day one, two, three, four, five, and on. So that also will be uh, considered during the immediate post of management and subsequent days. Uh, perfectly, perfectly said, Dr. Sanish. Uh, I think in terms of, uh, although in the talk as such, the focus is on de resuscitation, I think uh, prevention is better than cure. I totally agree with you. Uh, so whatever we do in the early phases and during the stabilization phase as well, if we can prevent giving fluids and uh, resort to probably the inotropic support at that stage to prevent any further fluids being administered, uh, that would play a, a much more vi uh, vital role later on in the stage as to how much of de has to be done later or if at all de is needed later. So taking 
uh, at most care into individual organ dysfunctions uh, prior to the perioperative management uh, will, will play an important significant role as to how bad the patient will become later on. Agree, pretty much agree with you. I think um, all the youngsters or residents attending this lecture, um, at least for a good percentage, this term de-resuscitation may be new to them. But I think uh, we are going to hear this word again and again more commonly in our ICU, our multidisciplinary rounds. And uh, as I mentioned, the rose is already appearing in our uh, notice board. So even our full team will be um, considering this uh, de-resuscitation in the subsequent days to come. And I think by that time, more robust evidence also should come. So uh, um, I think there is not much literature from our part of the world, right? Agreed, so agreed. The literature, we are depending on the European studies and all. So it's a good opportunity for our critical care residents also to plan research on this. So there are good enough, good institutions with the good monitoring facilities and uh, uh, infrastructure. So the more attention we give to this particular concept, I think uh, we can change the outcome, ICU outcome, rather than uh, blaming it on uh, secondary hit and all. At least we'll avoid one hit from outside. Agreed, 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 Dr. Anish. There is a clinical scenario, if at all uh, people are interested in attempting, but it will focus pretty much on uh, de-resuscitation, the key aspects that we touched upon in the talk. Okay, um, I think we have addressed uh, most of the queries. Uh, there are still some confusion regarding albumin because um, that is still there. We can combine albumin infusion with the RRT and the resuscitation. If so, albumin 5% or 20%. I think usually albumin is administered along with 5% uh, textrose. Off normal saline can be used as well. Um, and usually it is resorted to, and if, if you're thinking about an aggressive uh, de-resuscitation. So if you're going to take out quite a huge volume, then you could think about using albumin along with that. Or if the patient is already on a minimal dose of inotropic support, you don't want to destabilize the patient in that particular case, then that can be an indication for using albumin again. Or if you've got a hypoalbuminemic patient and uh, you want to replace to a certain level, which is not a perfect indication for you to do so, uh, but still people resort to, that can be anecdotally done as well. So these are three different areas that I could think of where uh, people tend to resort to albumin usage along with RRT or diuretics. One more thing, I think um, they are discussed during ICU daily rounds. The, the fluids, uh, the maintenance fluid is not the only the IV fluid we are giving. That uh, the fluid which goes along with our antibiotics and other infusions, everything should be added together. So we cannot uh, um, forego uh, those aspects as well. So we need to be meticulous in our intake output. Sir. We, <clears throat> we need to be more concentrating on the indications of organ damage, especially I think the most. Uh, um, higher rated one is pulmonary things, uh, rise in PF ratio or uh, signs of lung congestion and all, which will give you more indication that it's uh, time to consider uh, de resuscitation. Very important point uh, that has been highlighted there. Yes, uh, in, with, with regard to the RADA2 trial as well, I think when people have been recruited, the first step that they've been asked within the protocol to do is to stop maintenance fluids. Uh, I, I think that's a very, very valid, important point to consider. Agreed, agreed, Dr. Sameesh. Okay, I think um, we had an excellent session, a lucid talk, and um, a new concept has been introduced into our academic thing. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vivek Hamilton, for uh, being with us. We'll keep troubling you uh, to be part of our webinar campus in subsequent sessions as well. Apologies for the uh, technical glitch there. Apologies to the audiences as well. Okay, fine. Uh, we'll wind up the session for the day. Tomorrow we are having a mechanical ventilation session. That is our module eight. We'll have a case discussion on ARDS right from intubation to weaning. Uh, the case scenario will be, uh, we'll be following an interactive mode. And remember, we will not be discussing mechanical ventilation settings, alarm setting along. So we need to be ready with uh, other things also. How you start um, process, 
and a drop how you manage the um, uh, correction of the primary insult and all. So we'll get a comprehensive view. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar will be with us. So that will be module number eight. So for the night, uh, thank you very much, uh, our audience. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Vivek Anton for being with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.